Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains turk and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today's guest is a Canadian pro who has been a full-time online coach since 2021. She started her competition journey in 2018 and has completed a total of six shows, earning her pro card at the Toronto Pro Qualifier. Welcome to the show, AJ Miles. How are you doing? I am amazing. I'm so excited to be here. I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy you're here too. Seriously, like your energy is just amazing. Thank you. I, I try. I try to, you know, I, I, sometimes it's something that I feel like is a lot, but at the end of the day, like, it is what it is. I'm just like, I'm super excited. And yeah, th there will definitely be some energy. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I like to look at it like this. Even if your energy is a lot, it doesn't mean it's too much. It's, it's exactly. exactly. And I feel like it just, when you can be like authentically and like not filtering yourself, you just like, you find your people that way. That's people right. that are also lots of energy, but they get it. They get the vibes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly there's times where I like come out swinging and then I'm like oh wait adjust <laughs> the energy we're in a different space <laughs> turn it back a little bit here <laughs> it's like I'm at a concert and they're at the library like yes exactly exactly you just can't help it sometimes and it's something about just like chatting with people I think I'm just a yappy girl so when we get talking about like topics that I'm really passionate about I'm like <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> so you already know the drill on this. Like before we get into everything, I got to ask you if there's anything you do or think about right before your heel hits the stage. Um, chill the fuck out, basically. Like, um, I feel like it's such like a common thing when you're competing to like just black out. I remember the first time that I competed, I got off stage and I was like, what just happened um so I think that as I've like competed more I try to like breathe through it I try to calm down and the th I'm, I remember being backstage at Toronto being like you worked your ass off for 16 weeks obviously for this prep but also since I started bodybuilding in 2018 so like just be here it is what it is whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen so take a deep breath enjoy this moment for what it is because no matter what the outcome like you're here so just be here be in the moment and went pretty well so <laughs> that's awesome yeah I think that's so good especially because most competitors I think can say that at least once in their career they have felt like they blacked out on stage if not yeah. multiple times <laughs> So it is good to like get regrounded, recenter. Mm -hmm. I always find like thinking about like, okay, the, the actual feeling of the lights on my skin. Because it's so warm. It's hot. It's sweaty out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for the people who need like towels and stuff. No, the men. Like, and like, yeah. I, I mean, I think we obviously have gotten like put through the ringer where you're up there in comparison yeah. to like, five and six minutes but some of these guys are up there for so long and they're just dripping I'm like power to you like <laughs> wouldn't be me they're doing a full workout because they're actually flexing and we're up there like I'm not gonna flex I mean my lower back hurts but that's about that's about all you're gonna get from me is my back aches for the next three days exactly exactly but yeah no I don't know how they do it it is hot I remember the first time that I competed too I wasn't prepared for like how bright the lights were gonna be and it was just like, the crowd was like darkness it's like, yeah, this is right weird. you can't find people unless they're literally on the wings in the front yeah it was right front center because that's where your family goes like I, they usually would try to like get into this the front I'm like I can't see anything I can yeah. barely because I'm trying to fight for my life up here yeah. but like <laughs> yeah it's weird it's a weird feeling um I feel like the the thing that I 
practice doing after my first show was like visualizing when I would do my posing I would try to picture what it was going to look like with like the lights down on me and like looking into like darkness also just like posing in front of people because it is like especially if you're not like naturally good at posing like me I did move so freaking awkwardly when I first started posing like when you get used to it okay you're used to practicing by yourself but then someone watching is like you can get a little bit of stage fright so I mean not all gyms have posing rooms but at my gym I do so even that was something that I tried to do was like even when I go to look in the posing room if there was people in there instead of like walking away come back later go in anyways like still get used to posing in front of people and doing it in situations where you're like a little bit uncomfortable because it will help with being uncomfortable on stage. Absolutely. Like if I walk into the gym and I know I'm going to be practicing posing in that room and I walk in and I see a bunch of people, my first Mm -hmm. instinct is like, okay, I don't want to, Mm -hmm. but then I have to go, well, even if I don't want to, because it's gym people, it it's still people and you're going to have to do this. So I found over the years, it's gotten much more comfortable or I've gotten much more comfortable doing that because, oh, well, you know, like that's what's happening on stage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the thing is that it's just like, I I always practiced in places where I was comfortable and then I got comfortable doing just that one thing. So, and even like asking like, like your, your family and your friends, whatever to watch, like that's honestly really nerve wracking because those are people who be like, oh, that's kind of shit. Like, I feel like they're gonna yeah. be, if anyone's going to be honest with you, it's going to be people that are close to you. So like, do it in front of them, do it with the people you're most uncomfortable with, because that's when you're going to get that really like, this is a scary feeling like you know you might get on stage yeah I did it in front of some gym friends when I lived in Arizona and one of them goes whenever you sign off you look really uncomfortable and awkward and I'm like oh I mean, no, I'm thinking about that comment every time I do that no literally I have one friend who like also does posing coaching um and she was like your hands look like claws like every in every movement you're doing this like stop doing that <laughs> but you need to hear these things because like yeah. you again like it's like I don't know I feel like you can get sloppy with form and stuff in the gym too because you just get so used to doing the same habits over and over again with posing you're the same thing if you make a bad habit you practice it you stop seeing it because you're just used to having claws for hands and you don't really that's so true. I think that this is actually a really interesting subject, just the unexpected things as a first time competitor. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't talk about this enough on the podcast. So we'd mentioned like the lights, the not being able to see the crowd as much, um, how it can get pretty hot up there too. Mm-hmm. What else should someone maybe, oh, and blacking out, what else might someone, you know, that too. <laughs> Casual blackout. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so um and me and you before we hit record your name being pronounced wrong potentially so what else yeah. might people um not expect to happen but could happen um I think just show day in general I at least for like bikini girls um bikini is usually last so show day I feel like people expect to be like this really fun exciting like jam-packed day and the show days are fun obviously there's lots of adrenaline like some of my show days have been like some of the best days of my life. However, show day itself for bikini girl is typically not that fun. It's, it's, it's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of just like sitting around. I have gotten off stage at like 11 PM, 1130. Sometimes I've heard of girls getting off stage at like midnight. We, we do get like, especially in bigger shows, it's a, it's a lot of waiting around and obviously again like if you're waiting on stage for the first time that can be kind of nerve-wracking like I remember just walking back and forth to my pose and like over and over and over again which you want to be relaxing on show day you want to be zen you don't want to be on your feet running around but at the same time it's so hard to stop and turn your brain off when you're waiting to go get on stage Mm -hmm. so that's something that I definitely didn't expect and like my friends that came to watch they're always like is it always like this you have to wait hours to do this yes (laughs) I just got to the point of texting friends and family when like they were on maybe women's figure. I'm like, you could probably like go park. Go up now. Yeah. But yeah. You're, but then you've still got masters and wellness now. And yeah, exactly. And like, especially at the national shows, like they're just, they're so big. Uh, I think I told actually for Toronto Pro this year and last year, I was blessed. They flipped the order. 
So we did oh. judging was normal. Like that was like the normal order. And then for finals, they switched it. So it started with women's categories. Interesting. But that, sorry, my dog is barking, but that never happens. Like literally ever. I've never, yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah. So, I mean, great because I got my pro card and I got to go have like a whole evening, which is right. amazing. But yeah, that doesn't usually happen. Most of the time you're waiting all day for prejudging and then you're waiting all night for finals. That's just. Yeah. Like, and then you're just like, okay, I just want to get in the shower and go to bed. Like, but if you're done early, you're like, I can shower and go on a walk out in this new town. Exactly. And it's like, well, it's the thing is, again, you want to go for dinner. By the time you get off of stage, everything is closed. Yeah. Like, McDonald's being <laughs> really closed. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's one thing I feel like I would be mindful of is if you want to do like a big celebration plan it for like Sunday. Great, great tip. Like that's something I wish I could tell most. Like when I go to a show and someone's telling me it's their first time competing, their whole family's there, I'm like, and they're going out to dinner later. I'm like, like we have a reservation for eight. I'm like, cute cancel it <laughs> yeah literally it's not gonna happen and like to send yeah. your family they'll finish eating by the time you get on the stage i can bring you back some leftovers yeah. <laughs> i remember yeah. they did um during covid like there were some shows that were in like a one show format i don't know if the npc did yes. that in canada yeah. we did it and that honestly was like i feel like it was a little bit more efficient agreed However, I didn't love that either because again, like you put so much work into your prep, but like I wanted a full day. Like I did one show that it felt like we were literally on stage for, for, for 10 minutes. Like it's like you, you prepped for and, and suffered for 16 weeks for 10 minutes. So at least That's a it, good I mean, point. it's a long day, but it is still like your day. You look pretty, your makeup's done. Like, yeah, I'm that's true. It. Even though I definitely let, I was going to say, actually the COVID shows, if all shows were run like that, I would be so happy because I remember they told us, okay, women show up at this time and you're going to do your pre-judging and then we do like an intermission and then you'll come back and do your finals like right away. Or it was stacked. Like instead of it being finals are at five or six, they were earlier in the day. So it was just like, so good and they, because they had to look out for capacity too like they had to tell you when to come backstage and I felt it was much more efficient I think like the benefit of that like let's say that was how things were done you could book like photo shoots and stuff for that um, thing if you wanted to yeah yeah exactly yeah we, we just we're not usually going to get that option but it was one good thing about COVID, I guess. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Aside from having the show we prepped forever be canceled five times. Um, I did have one show canceled. I prepped in 2020 and at three weeks out, the show was canceled. Yeah. So that was fun. Love yeah, it was, it was so fun. Yeah. So there's so much I want to talk to you about. <laughs> I'm not really sure where I want to start. Um, I, I think we'll start with right now. Because you've recently decided to focus on defining balance as a professional bodybuilder, allowing yeah. your focus to be more on living life. So, mm -hmm. which by the way, side note, I sometimes get random comments on YouTube like, that's not a bodybuilder, that's a bikini. I'm like, she's a freaky bodybuilder, okay? She, she's a bodybuilder in the bikini division. Yes, she is. Um. Okay, so I don't know if I was like nervous, this timing to do this is like, I don't know if it's really good or really bad. I think it's good, but okay. I feel like I'm just at like a place where I'm at such a kind of a crossroads mm -hmm. with like my life. So okay. one thing I didn't expect about going pro was the existential crisis that came <laughs> after it. Um, because like, I don't remember a life before I started bodybuilding, like for as long as I can remember 2018, it was what, like 19 when I did my first show so all of my adult life I wanted to be a pro bodybuilder and in the back like bodybuilding is not something that just goes away it doesn't turn on and off like every single thing you put in your body is okay well is this going to be beneficial is this going to promote recovery um am I getting enough sleep like I want to I guess at like 19 and 20 after I did my first show every now and then I wanted to go out with my friends and be a 20 year old and get drunk and I would come home and be like oh my God, that was so bad. Like I shouldn't have done that. It's going to prevent you from going pro. So there was so long of like, and honestly that continued 
up until like this year really um and the, you just like you have so long where that is your like primary focus and it's in your head day in day out that when you finally like accomplish it you're like oh like what happens now like who am I if I'm not trying to be a pro and I feel like a lot of people would say like okay well you you're a pro now so now you just compete as a pro but I don't know it just it felt different where it's like I felt like I really really and I still feel like I really need a moment to like soak in like I worked for four years to be a pro I am a pro and I am typically someone that is like okay I accomplish a goal on to the next like it's just kind of like this hamster wheel of always accomplishing things never satisfied and this is the first time where I'm like I might just take a second and just be be here just be here I just accomplished something so freaking huge and I think that warrants me to just chill for a second and if like and this is this is the part that I'm nervous to talk about because like you said there's so many people that are like just judgmental and have this very black or white idea of like what a good bodybuilder is and especially now as a pro like there's this extra pressure of being like a good pro bodybuilder like if I want to like just go for a weekend and not take my scale and maybe not eat protein with every meal I might do it blasphemy (laughs) I might do it okay and like I still I, I love bodybuilding. I'm still passionate about it. It's something that I do like want to continue with, but I just feel like at this moment, I need to let myself like take my foot off the gas and just take some of that like pressure that has been there for years away. Doesn't mean I'm never going to compete again. Like I probably will, but I, like, I came off stage and I like text my coaches, okay, like, hey, when's, when's the pro debut? Let's make a season. Like, let's do this. And he's like, you know, there's no rush, right? But I think it was just like that pressure of like, okay, I accomplished a goal. I need to go to the next one. And after a few weeks, I was like, there really is no rush. So I don't know. I'm sure there are people that look at me in the way that I've been living my life and will say I'm a shit bodybuilder. And if you think that, like, that's freaking fine. Um, I went through this phase of like being nervous of wasting my potential, like, I think I looked really good at my last show. I was really happy. Looked I, looked. I, yeah. I was really freaking happy with it. And like, I think my, my shape is really good. I think muscularity wise, I don't think me personally, maybe this is just a, a, an ego thing, but I don't think I'm that far off of being like a good pro. Mm. So there's like a little bit of guilt there of like, what am I wasting my potential but then at the same time, like, what is the point in doing something just to do it? Like, if that's not going to make me happy to be a top pro right now, like, be a top pro later. Or, like, you can't, I feel like you can't plan those things and you can't make decisions based on, like, oh, I'm obligated to do this. Like, if it's not making you happy in the moment, then that's kind of all you can go by. So, Yeah. At this moment, I'm chilling. I'm allowing myself to not weigh food sometimes. I am drinking alcohol from time to time. Like when my friends want to go out and get espresso martinis, I'm doing it and I'm not feeling bad about it. If it takes me longer to get to like that end goal of being a top pro or top whatever or wherever my bodybuilding direction is going, like that's okay with me because I'd rather take my time and get there than like rush to the finish line and look back and be like I didn't even like enjoy it I just like raced for what reason so that's a wrap <laughs> girl I I want to encourage everybody listening to rewind and listen again <laughs> honestly you know something I always tell myself is why rush when you can relish you yeah. know relish in this relish in this moment relish in your accomplishment Mm -hmm. and also your life seasons change and you said what's the point of doing something just to do it and that really stood out to me because Mm -hmm. as athletes and as competitors we do get very one track minded well it is on to the next show I need to go pro or I need to accomplish this I got to win an overall that we don't tap into ourselves and go is this actually what I'm meant to be doing right now or called to be doing right now, or is it what I think I should be doing? And I think that shortens the lifespan of a lot of competitors because 
they're putting that pressure. And you can't really, I mean, you can thrive under pressure, but if you're not choosing that and enjoying it and loving it and you're just doing it to do it, are you really going to show up and give it the best you can? Probably not. If you're looking for competition heels, jewelry, and fun competitor extras, then visit shoefairyofficial.com and use code CELESTE for a discount at checkout. That is my thing right now with like taking a break. Not like, I feel like a break sounds so scary. And okay, and that's a thing too, is that I had so much fear around saying like, I'm taking a break because like what you get so fixated on bodybuilding that I feel like it was so scary to like detach from bodybuilding a little bit because so much of my identity is now in bodybuilding. So even then, like to say like, I'm taking a break. I'm like, it sounds so like, I don't want to say I'm taking a break, but it's, it's not that, I guess, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm, taking a break it's just not at like the top top of my priority list at the moment but the reason that I'm I'm doing that is because like if I'm going to continue my my bodybuilding career I want it to be because like I've taken time to pause reflect and it's like wow I I feel that passion like and that's the thing that's going to get you through a bodybuilding prep is like I think we all know by now it's not fun it is not something that is like super enjoyable every day, but the days that you feel like crap, like you still have that fire in your belly. Like I remember doing cardio and like, just like feeling what it feels like to be on stage. Like yeah. if you don't have that fire and that passion, it's just like, it's why are you doing it? So the, the, I'm allowing my, myself to shift priorities a little bit because I would rather them naturally prioritize themselves than like forcing it because there's an obligation to. Like I want to do it because I love it and I'm passionate and following my bird food meal plan and running on the Stairmaster is something that really is lighting my fire. And that I feel like is like, the thing with bodybuilding that people miss is it's like, well, well, how do you like it? It's like, it's just, it's it just, you just know, like, it's just passion. And that really needs to be there. And that's how I think, you know, if you're doing, if you're prepping, you're doing bodybuilding for like the right reasons. Mm -hmm. I imagine like a hamster is in its little cage and it's only got a wheel. Mm -hmm. So it's just running on the wheel nonstop. And then it eats, it drinks water, and then it goes back to the wheel. But then if you put in like a little tube, it's like, well, uh, should I go play in the tube or should I stay on the wheel? And then it plays in the tube. And it's like, well, now the wheel's not a priority. It's still there. I still love it. I still want to use it. But this is also now fun and important to me and exciting. And I can master this. So yes. you're like, oh, because I'm not on this wheel, I can see there's a tube in here that I can also enjoy. I'm just hanging out in the tube for a minute. Yeah. Like the wheel's there. Good. It's still there. But I, I yeah, I, I think I just, I am a bodybuilder and, I'm, and it took me a long time to also like let myself define myself as a bodybuilder. I don't know why. I think I've dealt with like imposter syndrome and like a lot of different things, but that's one of them was I never felt like, like worthy of being a bodybuilder. I don't really know why. I feel like I compare myself to people that like follow a meal plan 365 days a year and you see people that like eat sleep breathe bodybuilding and like in all of my off seasons like yes bodybuilding was a focus but I still did allow myself to live life so I was nervous of like calling myself a bodybuilder because I was nervous to have these people look at me and be like oh but you're not like you go to dinner on the weekends and you do xyz like you're not a real bodybuilder so I'm a pro. I'm a freaking bodybuilder. I'm a good bodybuilder. <laughs> and I exactly. don't have a problem saying that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, who, who, lost my train of thought. Where was I going with that? Well, I think it was, you were saying that sometimes you compare to others and it took you a while to define what being a bodybuilder meant to you. Yes. And that didn't happen till last year. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, like now that I have that definition, like I know that I am a bodybuilder, I think. 
I'm just kind of letting myself have my own definition of like right. what my bodybuilding journey looks like instead of trying to meet everyone else's. Um, and I am happy to be a bodybuilder, but I'm also happy to be other things. Like I am, I started a master's program last year. Did you? I did. I, it was, what? Uh, so I'm doing a master's in counseling. Girl! I'm going to be a therapist. That's yeah. awesome. We can set yeah. therapy memes to each other. Yeah, exactly. Which is actually like, I came to follow you because I like saw all of your stuff about like mental health and therapy and counseling. Oh, like, awesome. like God, amazing. Yeah. So like, that's something that I really, really want to like pour myself into because that's another thing I'm really freaking passionate about. Like that's yeah. why I started bodybuilding in the first place is because of like mental health. So that's just like another avenue that I haven't really experienced. Well, not that I haven't explored it, but like I'm still in school, so like I still have so much building of my like therapy career to do. I also am a coach. I've been coaching for three years, and I love it so freaking much. And bodybuilding, when you, especially when you're in prep, like I had to take a semester off of school because like my brain wasn't working. Like it's really hard to do school in general, but like especially like master's level school where it's like it requires so much and it was like I can't do this and meet with my group and practice like yeah. doing practical sessions when you're running on like two grams of carbs a day but I mean, this is not doing this program justice at all so it's just like it's allowing myself I think to expand my own identity of like who I am and what I love um and that's something that I really struggle with like even as a coach like allowing myself to like branch out and not fit yourself in certain boxes so I think that's really the journey that I'm on right now to like summarize it is I have tried to squeeze myself into like these categories and I don't feel like I always fit into them I don't feel like I'm your stereotypical bodybuilder and I'm also probably not your stereotypical lifestyle coach because I bodybuild and then I also am in school so it's like in I feel like I've been pulled in a lot of directions for a lot of years and I've been like fighting it trying to like push myself in one direction and now I'm at a point in my life where just accept it just be be all of the things like why do I have to be perfectly right. in one direction or another you know I wish I could like this is this is the I'm like throw in my microphone <laughs> mic drop literally like this is what I would want every competitor to hear is mm -hmm. what you're saying and I liken it to any sport any career there are really good therapists who don't yeah. have instagrams yeah to educate people right so when we look at bodybuilding what I find with a lot of the clients who come to me who struggle with the identity oh well I'm not this bodybuilder who's right. docu okay so there's a population of bodybuilders that document or demonstrate a lifestyle that looks a certain way mm -hmm. and they vlog it and it's their life and they also coach and they only eat sleep and breathe bodybuilding yep. you don't see a lot of the going out and if you do it's a picture of the dry steak and asparagus that they got so your association now with being a professional bodybuilder or being a successful bodybuilder is that but yeah. it's not because that's what being a successful bodybuilder is. It's because that is what is on the billboard, right? Yeah. That's what is being advertised and promoted by the select few who really do um, want to promote that. But think about all the bodybuilders who are teachers, nurses, moms, don't have an Instagram. Yeah. They, they don't have a YouTube channel. Yeah. They ha they're married. They're traveling the world. They're engaged in other sports and other interests but they're successful. They're competing consistently. They can take time away. They can go pro. But I just caution people, you know, are, are you associating it with this just because of what you've seen or because this is how you truly want to live and experience becoming a professional athlete? And exactly. you have to challenge those ideals. Exactly. I think that's what I've kind of been going through is it's it's finding the line between this is what I should be doing versus this is what I want to be doing. Because like, I mean, again, I am a pro now. Was I perfect on my, my off seasons, like leading up 
to to going pro like no even even last year like my in my off season my off season leading up to winning my pro card was the most productive off season I have ever had um it also was my shortest off season that I've ever had I also took six weeks off because I had surgery I visited home for three weeks for Christmas and went to the gym three times I went to Aruba with my family and went to the gym a handful of times um I moved to Toronto at the very I think I competed actually get this I moved into this condo on my show day girl on my show day I came home from my show and came home to an unfurnished apartment and slept on an air mattress I sent my mom out during my show day to go buy me pots and pans so I had something to cook with in the morning so that is, that's Wait, a- was that 2023 or 24 2023 so that was the year you placed fifth in the Toronto Pro yes that is amazing yes so that was that and then after like competing so I I'm also I moved during that prep oh. moved Moved during the prep and I drove because I wanted my car here. I am from Newfoundland. Newfoundland's an island. So I drove nine hours across the island, got on a ferry, sat on the ferry for 12 hours, drove through um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, and finally made it to Ontario. And I was in prep. So I had to stop to do cardio and work out along the way. You're a terrible bodybuilder, AJ. Terrible. Who would do that? Horrible. Like, it's awful. It was terrible. Anyways, You're dedicated or committed, just I mean, you should never go out with your friends because obviously you don't care enough about this. No, exactly. Like I, you literally. Anyways, so it took five days. I was in the car for five days because of how I had to keep stopping to like do my workouts, stop to meal prep. I had a cooler in the back with all my meals, That's but awesome. I'm not not dedicated. Awful bodybuilder. Correct. Anyways, um, <laughs> that was a side story. Where was I going with that? Oh, so I like I moved during my prep. Then I moved into like my actual apartment on my show day. So also the whole month after I did my show in 2023 was like, holy fuck, I moved. I just finished a prep. So like, honestly, that whole month was like, yeehaw. <laughs> Seriously. Live it up in Toronto. So like, I don't even know how many like productive, not how to say productive, that sounds bad, but like I I li- I did things. Like I traveled, I had dinners out, I met up with friends, I did lots of things in my shortest prep ever when I had surgery. And that still was like my most productive prep. Because I think what I've learned and what I, I'm still working on applying is like when you're doing something, do it with 100 percent mm-hmm. So when I'm in the gym, I train hard. Like I, I, and that's, I think my, the thing that is, is easy to bodybuild with me is like, I love training. I love it. Like I will train until the day I die. If I, hopefully I can, because I love that shit. So I'm in the gym. I'm there 1000%. I want to be there. And then what I'm, what I'm working on, which is honestly the harder part is like when I'm doing things like relaxing or going out, like turn your brain off and just be there. Like, let yourself be unproductive, just chill, enjoy it, and then get back to it. So it's allowing myself like a little bit of balance, but also like committing to the balance. Like you're not out to dinner feeling bad about it. You're not in the gym wishing you weren't there. Like you're doing it and whatever you're doing, you're just present doing that. Such great advice too because I think that actually allows you to focus on other things in your life you know that when you're in the gym you're in the gym when you're with your friends you're with your friends when you're with a significant other you're with a significant when you're doing mental health work you're doing mental health work when you're studying you're studying it makes such a big difference I think what also is underestimated in an athlete's career and mental health is the benefit of having other things to focus on outside Mm -hmm. of the sport. So the fact that you were able to do all of that, while obviously is an amazing display of your dedication and commitment, and many people maybe would have quit because they're like, well, I need to be more on this only. You persevered. And I think in your ability to compartmentalize those things and give your all to each, you actually 
as a result, we're probably more successful than you would have been if you're like, well, I'm going to delay moving. I'm going to delay working on this. I'm going to delay and so on and so forth. So you actually probably improved as an athlete as a result of that. Yeah, I think so. And like um, my coach, I started working with him in 2022. And when we like started, I also almost didn't do this prep. I was like very close to not doing it. The 2024? Yeah, like I I know I was like so close to not doing it. So I traveled with my family in January. Um and I like I came to Toronto because I wanted to make myself uncomfortable. That's why I moved here. I wanted the push of like living in the most expensive city in the freaking country. I wanted to push out of my comfort zone, but I didn't realize like how much pressure I put on myself and how much stress I have of that until I kind of like took a minute to go travel. And when I had no responsibilities, it was like, oh my God, I am going through it. And I don't even notice it because it's so normal. So I went on this trip with my family and canceled my flight home twice because I was just like not ready to, to go home and go back to it. And I was, I was basically coming back to like start my prep for 2024. So I was having this crisis of like, if I don't want to go home, do I even want to prep? Like, do I want to be doing this at all? And I came back and I said, to my, like, I didn't, and this is really interesting is I didn't talk about my prep on Instagram. I didn't even say that I was competing until it was six weeks out, which usually I would be blasting that shit like all over Instagram. I didn't speak about it until six weeks out because I genuinely didn't know if I was getting on stage. And I almost pulled out. Like at I so I started at 16 weeks and my body like was not super responsive. Um, I think I dropped five pounds in the whole first like seven or eight weeks, which is like it wasn't great. Like I needed, I, I had like, I had to come down. I started my prep 20. What is, okay. I started around 140 and competed at 112. What is that? <laughs> like, Are we talking pounds? Pounds. Yeah. Is that so about what? 32? Wait, 32. Wait. I know. Why is it hard? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> 28 pounds. 20, okay, that's right. I gave the wrong two. I said 32, <laughs> but it would have been. Okay, 28 pounds. So I had to lose 28 pounds in 16 weeks, which it, you need to, things need to move for, yeah. for that to happen. So at nine weeks out, I text my coach. I said, if things are not moving this week, I'm done. Like, this is it. It's clear. This is not my time. I'm half in, half out mentally. Like, it's just not the right time for me. And that was the week I dropped like six pounds that week. And I was like, okay, we're going to do this now. And then because you just took the pressure off, you're like, okay, well, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, great. I think that's why the entire prep went so well. Like I have been someone that is very, I remember in my 2023 prep. So I moved to, do you, are you familiar with pure muscle and fitness? It's in Toronto. It's like, Definitely one of the bigger gyms like here in Canada for bodybuilding. No. Okay. If you ever come to Toronto, it's definitely worth checking out. It's a fantastic gym. Um, so if anyone listens from there, shout out. Um, so I moved to basically go to this gym. Um, but then I literally trained in a sweatpants and in a hoodie for the rest of my prep, which usually in a prep, you're like, oh my God, I am so lean. I look amazing. Like I'm training naked. I covered up. Because I was so self-conscious of people looking at me being like, oh, she's not ready. She is whatever. Like I was so in my head about what other people were judging of like my look and my progress. This year, because I said nothing, I was like, people don't even know that I'm prepping. Like no one's judging me because they don't know. And maybe, maybe I'm giving myself too much credit and no one actually gives a shit if I'm prepping or not or judging me or whatever. But in my head, I felt like, I was being judged by people knowing. So this year when I was like, I'm just going to not talk about it. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm going to stay in my own lane. And exactly what you said, like whatever happens, happens. If I get shredded and look like a pro, great, I'll compete. If I my body's not responding, there's no stress. Like it's like, it's not like 
people aren't looking at me anyways. If I don't want to compete, I don't want to compete. And that's just it. So it just really took the pressure off of like other people's opinions. And it, I a hundred percent think that that's why this prep was like the smoothest prep that I've ever had. Like it, it's not that it wasn't hard because I was the leanest that I had ever gotten. And I definitely pushed myself harder than I ever had, but I also knew that I was doing it for me. Like there was no thoughts in the back of my head of, oh, if you don't do this or if you don't get leaner, X, Y, Z is going to look at you and say that you can't, or you're going to be embarrassed on stage and people see you. It was literally just, I'm doing this because I want to do this. I want a crock at a pro card. I want to bring my best package to the stage. And like, that's just, I, I don't know, I, that changed like everything for me was this being the only prep that I didn't talk about publicly. And it was also my first prep that I did single. Single. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay, we're going to talk about that because there's a few things you said that I want to touch back on and kind of dig on a little bit. So you weren't sure if you were even going to do this and you were on a trip with your family and you actually postponed returning and you were questioning because you had realized the amount of pressure you were under on a consistent basis when you were home, whereas the trip was like a relief of that pressure. So when you came home, were you like resistant to the things you needed to do for prep or were you like okay I'm just going to commit to it and you did it but your body wasn't responding it's it's that I did it I have like ever since my first prep I didn't even really understand prepping when I did my first show I did not do enough research I'll be totally honest with that I literally was like oh that looks cool let's do that I'd never tracked a macro before my first prep don't recommend doing that um but I just kind of like flip a switch where I'm like I'm in prep now I am a soldier like whatever I have literally said to my coach if you tell me to eat dog food I will eat dog food like I am doing what I'm told so I follow my protocols I didn't miss anything but I think it was like the the mental like conflict of do I really want to be doing this like why am I doing this why am I putting myself through this and there's like just the thoughts of like, where is this going? I switched to being an enhanced athlete in 2023. So there was those thoughts of like, how long am I going to do this for? Like Mm -hmm. in in my head, I was like, if I don't go pro this year, like how much longer am I exposing my body to these drugs? And even, even as a pro, like how willing, how how much am I willing to push it with like exposing my body? Like I do, I do want a family and I do want to like live a long and healthy life. So it's something that I do consider and care about, Um, you know? So it's, it's, I was just very, very conflicted of like, what am I doing this for? And I think that week where like things actually picked up, it was like just the last thing where I was like, okay, it's happening or it's not. I took the pressure off and was like, I'm going to respond or I'm going to not. And then things kind of like fell into place from there. And it was, it was a pretty smooth prep. From that point. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy too how many of us give up right before we get there. Exactly. And that's what happened to you. You're like, I'm about to give up, but you didn't. And then your body had a breakthrough, your mind had a breakthrough. Mm-hmm. You ended up earning your pro card. Yeah. And transparently, that's kind of been what goes through my head. I mean, I've talked to so many pros now through this podcast and heard so many stories. And then I'm like, I'm kind of in this headspace now where I'm like, this is the first time I'm not like, I must go pro. I can't like, it's my identity. I want, I'm just like, if it happens, awesome. If it doesn't, awesome. Like there's so much more that I'm living for. Exactly. But there is that like, obviously I still want it and I would regret it if I didn't do this prep, but I would be lying if I said, oh yeah, right. When coach told me we're starting prep, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. If he had told me seven months ago, I'd probably been like, sweet, let's do it. But like, I got like two years of two. Well, yeah, it was two years of improvement season. Mm -hmm. And I got in such a good groove. And you were talking early on in this podcast, you know, okay, I want to go somewhere without a scale. I want to be able to have a meal without protein in it. And my improvement season, I was like every single day on point, like a prep. But then again, If I wanted this piece of chocolate, I had it. If I went to Austria, I didn't track it. I went to speak at Whitney Weiser's retreat in Tulum. I just ate what was there and I ate my competitors who have been in this long enough are the most equipped to do 
intuitive or intelligent eating, yet we're the most judgmental and harsh on ourselves about it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, that's the thing is even when I'm not tracking and eating intuitively, I'm not eating like an asshole. If I want to go out and have like a full fledged, like asshole meal, I will. But like 90% of the time, like again, transparently, I haven't, I've, I haven't really been following a meal plan or tracking for the past like month. I'm still very close to what I would be eating, even in a prep. I'm eating every right. single food that I'm eating right now is the same food that I was eating in prep because I like it. That's yeah. I, I like feeling good. I like vegetables. Like I want to eat right. and veggies and rice because I just I want to. Yeah. But that's again, it's coming back to like I want to do this. I don't feel like I'm in jail because I'm choosing to do it. It's not like an obligation. And I think that I have a lot more freedom and there's a lot less tension of like eating really well right now versus when I first was post-show because I was like oh I should be on my meal plan but I don't want to be on my meal plan and when you just let that that pressure go you kind of come back to like oh no like I don't have to like I, I I want to do this you know yes that choice mentality instead of the chore mentality exactly so before I ask you about your mental health, as well as like competing single for the first time, mm. I've been really curious about why you even wanted to go pro because, you know, you pursued it for four years. You said that this was a goal of yours. The last year was maybe where there was some rockiness in how that looked or felt, but what was it that was motivating you to pursue it? Um, Honestly, I think it was just like, when it's so funny because I have this like journal that I wrote in like I got back from my first competition and I like wrote in my journal and was like I love bodybuilding I want to be a pro bodybuilder and I even after I competed I think I wrote like do the Arnold and then do the Olympia until I go pro which is like oh that's not really how it works girl but like I I, I, like, I, I knew so little about it and yeah. still knew that it was just something that like, I, I guess I could do really well. in. And I think the thing with bodybuilding is I played lots of sports growing up, but I was never great at them. I was always the kid that was like, you're fine. Like you're not terrible. Like I would like be on the teams, but I was like on the bench and I'd get to go in when like someone got hurt type, type deal. Like I, I never felt like I excelled. Um, Same thing in school. Like my grades were fine, but they weren't like amazing. So I felt like a lot of time, like growing up and even into like my early adult life, I just felt very like average per se. And when I started bodybuilding, that was the first time that I was like, I'm good at this. Like, I love this. This is easy for me. I felt like I stood out in the gym. I felt like people just kind of naturally came to me for like advice and tips because I just, I don't know. I, I, it's just something that like, it just clicked. And that was one of the, the first things in my life that I felt like I kind of feel like I'm I'm made for this. So in going, wanting to go pro, I think it was more so of like, just pushing and it wasn't even an attachment with like going pro it was just like I am good at this I want to see as far as I can go with with bodybuilding right now because I love it because I'm good at it because it it's makes me like happy and it's what people had like said to me so if I had been like a group of friends or a group of whatever where people didn't know about bodybuilding people would literally say afterwards, like if someone asks you about bodybuilding, they're stuck. They're in a corner. Like no one tried to interrupt for like 20, 30 minutes at least because I would get so passionate about it that I would just like talk and talk and talk and talk. And like, I could go on for days. And like we said, like before we even started the podcast, when I'm excited, like I'm like yelling, I'm be- I'm sweating talking about it because it's the same. And my sweatshirt being off. <laughs> yeah, like I'm so worked up talking about it because like, I, I loved it. It was probably the first thing that I felt like really, really passionate about. Um, and with like school and psychology, I knew that I loved it, but I, it's different when you're in school and you're learning about it versus actually like being in your career. So mm-hmm. bodybuilding was the first thing that like I loved and I knew I loved and I got to actually do. So 
it was a goal to go pro kind of it was more so a goal of like continuing to be passionate about something and like just wanting to fulfill what I felt like I had potential in wow that is amazing I love it it's very natural progression yeah yeah I I never I don't feel like I set out to be like I want to be a pro it was just like I feel like I'm great at this I love this I want to see what I can do with it and that's kind of still where I'm at is it's like yeah okay it will be amazing like I even after my my show this year I get happy messaging me being like you look just like Jen like you're gonna be the next Jen I'm like as much as I would love to be the next gen, like if if that's where my passion ends up and that's where it ends up going, great. But like, is my goal to win the Olympia? Like, I would say no. My goal is more so to just like continue to do what I'm passionate about and wherever that leads me, then that's where I go. That's it. I love that. This whole conversation is just awesome. Like, this is so awesome on so many levels. I mean, I feel like we're speaking a very similar language mm-hmm. as far as like pursuit of bodybuilding and pursuit of other life things. Yeah. I can say like when I studied psychology, that was where I felt like I oh, finally found my thing. And then yeah. that naturally led to a counseling degree where exactly. I always was like, I will not go to school and do all that thing. I just did the degree to do it. But then yeah, after same, same. I was like, shoot, I really like this. I want to be even better for my clients. Let me go get this counseling degree. That's literally why I went back to school was because I going through school, I was like, I don't want to be a counselor. I don't want to listen to people's problems all day. But then you start coaching. You're like, oh no, I do though. (laughs) Oh, I love counseling. Man, it is so, that's the one degree. Well, then again, I've only done this degree is a higher level degree. So who am I to say that's the one degree? Yeah, I've got all the degrees. (laughs) With my 10 degrees is my favorite. (laughs) Yeah. From my experience in clinical mental health counseling, that is the education route I would suggest everybody study or at least learn about. But Mm -hmm. what's funny is when I've said this to other people, they're like, are you sure? Because it seems like something you're just really passionate about. (laughs) And like, like it You're changes the way you think. Yeah. Yeah. It, does. yeah. it changes how you communicate, how you t- think about things. I feel like is to have like a counselor bodybuilder mix is rare. Yeah. Um, I feel like as much as people like speak about mental health in, in the fitness field, like I think it's, it's, it's very talked about and how like going to the gym improves your mental health. Like everyone like yeah. knows these things, but to actually have like educated clinical practitioners in like the fitness space and in the bodybuilding space, exactly. I don't feel like there's like that many people that can like actually like speak on experiences in both. And I think a lot of times like fitness things are stereotyped as like, I think for a lot of, of counselors, bodybuilding would be categorized as bad like I know of of some people that would say like well don't track food and don't track whatever and and why are you bodybuilding and don't bodybuild because it is an extreme and I understand that but I think the thing with being a coach and being a counselor which I'm sure you would agree with is it's like you look at the person in front of you Uh just because and maybe for one person, they shouldn't be bodybuilding. Like maybe they've made like really negative associations and their relationship with food and exercise are fucked. And in that case, then sure, yes, like pull them away from the stage and let them kind of come back to like their intuition. But I don't think that's necessarily should be a protocol for everyone. I think that's okay. like why I think that's why it's so special to have like counselors, coaches, bodybuilders kind of like all in the one mix because we can appreciate that what works for one person isn't going to work for another person and what's detrimental to one person's mental health might completely 180 someone else's. So it's just being able to like take all those things into consideration. I think that's what like our, our like mental health background teaches us is that it's like view everyone as like a blank slate, take all the things into consideration. And that's when you can kind of help someone to be like, okay, these are the things that are really inhibiting you. And this is, you know, what we can continue to do to move forward. Absolutely. And for so many bodybuilders, mental health inspired 
them starting. So to tell them not to do it, I think is a disservice to a lot of athletes. I have always said, I think you can have your mental health and be a competitive athlete. Mm -hmm. You started because of mental health. And I know you've wanted to talk about overcoming anxiety as well as abusive relationships. So are those Mm -hmm. things you personally experienced and maybe just speak to that a bit more? So I, I don't think that I would be in the gym right now if I hadn't been in an abusive relationship when I was like 17, 17, 18, anyways, early, like teenage years. Um, that relationship made me like, I hope that no one can relate to this, but I'm sure that people that will, when you genuinely feel like you have no purpose on this planet, like, and I think again, I hope no one can relate, but when you're in a relationship with someone that is abusive, like they will beat you down to a point where you have no self-worth because then you create that dependence on them. Like I genuinely felt like I could not survive without this man. And then when we broke up, it I didn't even know where to start to build myself back up. Like our relationship was over and I was actually like just a body on earth because I did not know what to do with myself like to be beaten down to that extent and have to come back up from it it's really freaking hard um and going to the gym like I hadn't gone to the gym at all in that relationship I only went because the couple of friends that I hadn't pushed away during this relationship were going to the gym and I was like okay well you're going I'll go I have nothing else to do with my life And going once or twice, I went because I loved it. And like, again, like I love training. I love, like, I I still love training at that point too. But it was the first thing that I did that was just for me. It was something that it was going to affect no one else. It was something that no one else can take from you. Like relationships come and go, friends come and go. But like your, your gym, your gym, your, your fitness journey and your goals and like building, building yourself back up. That's untouchable and that is why it was so powerful for me because after having my entire self-esteem ripped from me in this relationship this just felt like it was like no one has anything to do with this this is just for me um and then I did my so this was 2016 2017 I did my first prep in 2018 and that was the first time that I really learned boundaries and like prioritizing myself of like I can say no to things if I don't want to go. I don't feel obligated to people, please, if I want to stay in instead of go out. Or it was just like, it was learning to do these things for myself and no other reason. So those are things that I will take with me for the rest of my life. So shout out to my shitty ex. Hope you're awful. However, I wouldn't be here without him. I honestly like I learned so much from coming out of that. And then through that first prep, like I'll I'll take those lessons with me for like the rest of my life. And like that's why fitness, bodybuilding has such a special special place in my heart because like they really did. Like I think I learned resilience over anything coming out of like each of those experiences and work ethic also. Like wanting to do things for yourself that's such a beautiful testament to coming out of something that wrecks you and seeing it as an opportunity to Mm -hmm. build yourself up like a fresh a fresh slate versus oh I'm beaten down and I can't get back up yeah something I realized when I was in an emotionally abusive relationship verbally and emotionally Mm -hmm. was that I made a lot of excuses right. for this person because you'll experience cycles of it's really good and then it's mm-hmm. really bad. And then you highlight all the good. You want the good to be good because- you Cling to the good. You cl- Literally, you're clinging. That's just what I try to explain to people because well, it was kind of a public relationship, which I regret. And that's why now nobody knows anything about my <laughs> life. Well, Same. you know, but now you don't know. We don't know. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So- yeah. So now I'm like, no, I don't do that. But that that was a good lesson for me. But because of that, you know, on the surface, maybe it looked really good. And it gave me a lot of empathy for people who 
end up ending like public relationships and it's like on the outside it looked really really good and then people are like well why didn't you ever show the bad it's like because the bad was like you can't really show it you can't Mm -hmm. you can't demonstrate it in the way that the good you're like a magnet to it's all you're holding on to and they they make this was my experience it can make you feel like you're the best thing in the world and the worst thing in the world at the same time and so something I realized was some of my excuse making was because I didn't want to identify it or couldn't identify it as wrong so what were some of the things you endured that if someone listening might be enduring them too could actually go oh maybe I should leave this it doesn't get better so yeah what were some of those things you endured personally if you're willing to share yeah of course um and that's the thing too is like it takes so long to like come out of these things and recognize it but like I I hope that like in talking about it more it can help people recognize because that's and I I was 17 like I didn't even know what abusive relationships were at the time and my and like I said I pushed all of my friends away all of them thought that I was just like obsessed with this guy and blew them all off. But it was just that like I was being, so this is one of the things like I was being so isolated by this person. He had told me that like my friends were bad friends that I shouldn't be talking to them. I shouldn't trust them. My, my parents were bad parents. Like my relationship with my parents is incredible. Like my mom is genuinely my best friend. So to be hearing these things of like, you shouldn't trust your mom. You shouldn't tell her things. Like she just doesn't want us to be together. She doesn't want you to be happy like that. Like it's right. creating an isolation. So you're pushing people around and or you're pushing people away from you because people like this, they want you to only be dependent on them. So if you're finding that you are only allowed to hang out with this person and you're only allowed to trust this one person, very red flag like you should be your friends and family should be supported by your relationships um the thing I think that what makes it so hard to recognize is that it happened at least for me so slowly like we were so happy huh. for three months and it started like really slowly and it started with just like oh my god there is I'm trying to think of like, and you, you kind of like black it out. You really do. You'll you, be randomly talking to a friend. You're like, oh, by the way, this happened. They're like, wait. <laughs> yeah. So it escalated really slowly. I remember him saying like, like name calling. So like, it maybe probably started with like, you're being a bitch and then turned into like, you are a bitch for this. Um, If he had like made a mistake, acted out, obvious people like this are not typically like super faithful people so I had caught him like talking to another girl he'd be like oh well you you were a bitch and you pissed me off so if you hadn't done that then I wouldn't have had to like talk to this person they cannot take responsibility exactly so if if he can't take responsibility for or or she because I mean this could be women oh yeah um so lack of being able to take responsibility everything being blamed on you um then it got into things like you're not good enough for me. Like I, you're not going to do better than me. Um, really again, just like beating down the self-esteem and like creating that dependence. Um, it like, I think that things being physical with your partner is, is never, I don't mean physical, isn't like intimately like right. physical abuse, physical abuse. Is, <laughs> is never okay. And you will, I think because it happens so slowly, make excuses for it like even like for me the physical side of things happened very slow um he I was like getting out of the car one day and he like pushed me so I like kind of stumbled out of the car um he would like pull on my hair in a fight or like I'd be standing against the wall and he'd punch like the side of the wall so it wasn't actually punching me like he would he would definitely say like oh no we were never physical or like we'd be in a fight he like step on my toes so it was, it was not like I'm punching you in the face, but it was, I am stronger than you. Remember that. And now that I'm reflecting, like I didn't recognize it at the time, but now that I look back, it's like, it was intimidation and that's what it was. So like, and even then, like I went through this phase of like, well, I wasn't really physically abused. Like, mm, no, babe, like he was pulling your hair, not in a good way. He was like, you know, like. <laughs> he was intimidating you in a physical way and 
that is not okay on any level. So like, if, I don't know, if anyone has experienced those things where you're questioning, like, is he being, am I being physically abused? Like, if you have to question it, Mm. that's all you need to know. And even like questioning anything, like if you have to question, am I, am I, Am I in an abusive relationship? Is this relationship healthy? I feel strongly now after being in and out of a couple health, much healthier relationships, like you don't question things when they are healthy because you just feel good. You feel healthy. You don't have to be like, mm, is this okay? Because you know that it's okay. Mm. So yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, I worry that these types of relationships are more common than I even realized so I do hope that like in kind of like speaking about these things blatantly or like this actually like examples of what happened because I don't know maybe if I had heard like no that is abuse at the time like I would have been able to be like oh maybe um he he actually he snapped my phone in half one time we were in a fight and he I don't know how you do that like how do you break an iPhone oh my goodness well I don't even know how like that's like some like super strength anyways um there's just I think yeah anything that is like damage your property intimidating you isolating you beating on your self-esteem making you feel like you're not good enough yeah we're not doing it we're just not doing it love that I'm glad you're talking about this and opening about up about that too like the specific behaviors because it is hard to get out now you said that you guys obviously broke up was it uh, was it an extended breakup like break up get back together or was was it a very this is a hard line in the sand I'm done um it was break up get back together for it went on for like probably a year which again I feel like is not super uncommon um actually he ended up blocking me oh thank you best thing that he ever did for me um but yeah and that's you just you're so brainwashed and so manipulated like I genuinely thought that I would like needed this person I was in love with this person so when they're playing mind games of like oh like I love you I still love you I want to be with you I want to continue this relationship it really fucks your head and you're like oh my god yes like we had like broken up and then stopped talking and then like started hanging out again and it, yeah like it, I change and things and every time it's good for like a week or two weeks or a month or whatever and you get so happy because you're like oh my god he's finally fixed it's not he's never fixed yeah <laughs> girl he's not so he ended up blocking me and that's another thing too is like I felt a lot of guilt around that for so long because obviously after like coming out of the relationship and like reflecting I'm like and I stupid like why am I so easily easily manipulated that like I couldn't see what was right in front of me like me and my mom had this conversation too of like even her like my mom also was like a, a counselor like she's like I don't know how I didn't see it like I don't know how n- no one was able to like call it what it is yes but you just I don't know if you are able to get out of it like at this point, I look back and I know that I made decisions that were like definitely not well thought out. But this is one thing I've learned is that everyone, people are, people are good for the most part. Good mm-hmm. people, people are trying their best. And when I look back on that situation, I did do my best for what I I for the information I had at the time I'm not proud of the decisions that I made I'm not proud of continuing to get back with him and all these things but like I know that that's just what that that's the best I could do at the moment and I've learned from it I've grown from it you live and you learn that's really all you can do that's a good point too because I think there's so much shame wrapped up in even leaving the relationship like oh well there were all these good things or I told I spoke so highly of him to protect his image and what are people gonna think or well what if he does change and then why did I miss all these things I should have left a long time ago that was yeah. one for me I'm like there was literally a red flag right at the beginning and I didn't leave well what, what oh. was I thinking oh yeah like why did you even start it I think I'm pretty sure I like started my relationship with him being like, oh, I slept with your friend, but don't worry. I really like you. We should be together. I'm like, yes. <laughs> what? Yeah. I got one of those. Hey girl messages. 
Oh, no. <laughs> Open that hey girl, hey girl. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> and I was like, this is a joke. And I, I made excuses for it. And now I'm like, and I suffered oh. so much as a result of that. Like, I even looked different. Like, I look at photos from that relationship. Like, my body wasn't happy. I, I think my face looks different. I'm like, I don't know. Seriously. My face, but like, I look totally different. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for a while there, I thought maybe we dated the same person. <laughs> <laughs> look at this now, everybody. <laughs> Honestly, though, um, I think more people do need to discuss these things. And I, I learned so much from reading about yeah. other people's stories. And this is also like one of those things. It's a fine line in relationships where you want to protect your partner and your relationship, like autonomy to some degree, where it's like you don't want to yeah. air out all your dirty laundry all the time. But yeah. there are certain things that get said and done that really, I think, need to be discussed with a trusted friend or counselor. Yeah. And I remember talking to one of my best friends and I was telling her some of this stuff and she was like, she did, kudos to her. She never told me to leave, but she did say, I went through this experience. Here's what I learned and um, you'll get through it too. And then I remember being like, well, she, she literally gets it. And she told me stories about her own experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for that because you can't tell someone to leave uh, as, as weird as that sounds, you really can't. It, but I think by having people you can talk to is good. And I would encourage people like it can it can look good. It can feel good every once in a while. But if the majority of the time you're on edge, yeah. you're constantly questioning yourself, you're waiting for the next shoe to drop, you're yeah. um, worried that if you bring up a problem, it's going to be a blame game, no responsibility taken. It's time to let it go. 100%. And it doesn't even have to get to the point of abuse before you can say, okay, wait, this is an unhealthy pattern. Um, and so that's what I'm, I've kind of learned. And this is something that I also think is difficult is regaining trust in yourself as a person. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that I like went through, like in, that was the only like really awful person I dated. I've dated nice people since then. Um, lots, I've had like long, a couple long-term relationships, like we there are good men in the world um but that's the thing is that it's like my first relationship after that was then like a lot I needed so much reassurance of like but do you love me and do you do whatever which like granted I think that I probably needed more time to like deal with those things before getting into another relationship because I questioned my self-worth so much that that was then straining on even like a healthier relationship because like I just wasn't confident in like trusting myself and trusting other people like I think you really do and you learn this through dating you learn this through time yourself but like your self-worth should be untouchable it's something that like if you and you should I think that you should have your own oh, this would be a long time to learn you should have your own life and your own routines and your own goals and ambitions and your autonomy like should be there to the point of when you're dating someone obviously yes like plan a life with someone and do whatever like that's what relationships are for like we love supportive partners that's amazing but I personally don't want to be at a point ever again where if my partner wakes up and they decide I'm out of here my life isn't crushed mm -hmm. like I still I will be sad again like I I love to be in love I like to be in relationships a lot but I don't want to have my entire life attached to another person. And I don't think that honestly anyone should because it just creates this dependence on like, I need you in my life versus you're in my life because we support each other and we make each other want to be better and we bounce off each other and we are just a good team. You know, like I think those are reasons to be together versus I don't know who I am without you. My life revolves around you. And that has taken quite a few relationships to get to. But finally, at the ripe age of 25, I feel like I've finally figured that part out. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we, were, we made it. Like, that is growth, though. That's life. Like, I why we, like, I think we all have this idea that we're supposed to do it right the first time. Like, we're just yeah. supposed to get it right, not make mistakes. 
uh, but so many of us go through these experiences and we learn the hard way, or maybe we have to learn the lesson more than once, or we don't heed the advice of someone with a lot of wisdom. Like there are certain things we'll go through, but are we to expect ourselves to always get it right? I mean, I didn't even get bodybuilding right the first time. I look back at my first prep. Like what? What Yeah, I'm like, I'm sorry. Why am I doing incline sprints in between my lifts? Like that doesn't even make sense. I ate a protein bar on show day. Like, do you want to poo? No. I <laughs> could. <laughs> what? I didn't drink water for three days, actually. So no, I'm pretty sure I did the same like classic water load. And then my my first show, my lips are like cracked in my pictures. I dehydrated so bad. That's such a great point. Yeah, it really like just everything deflates yes makes no sense yeah now that, again but i think it goes for literally anything in life i'm sure everyone can relate to that like you look back on some things and you're like wow that's a doozy <laughs> learned a good lesson from that one let me do that yeah. <laughs> oh me i did yeah exactly but i don't know again like that's that's kind of the nice thing is even at like I don't feel like 25 is that old but like I'm not old you just started taking care of your own insurance yeah literally like I, I don't your know. brain I, just finished developing I just got my frontal lobe this year <laughs> it's <laughs> done it's cooked <laughs> you know, she needs more time but yeah I don't know I just I feel like even at this at this age I can look back and look at all the things that I've been able to learn and and like develop and grow from which I remember making this goal in I think it was 2022 maybe 2021 and I had said like I don't want to reflect and it was around like New Year's I said I don't want to reflect on a year ever again in my life where I feel like I didn't grow in any any capacity I don't want to be in the same place that I was on any New Year's I don't I don't care if it's like it doesn't need to be a massive like career milestone that would be great but like it's more so like I I want to be developing as a person every single year so if I can be on New Year's on New Year's Eve and look back on my year and know that I grew in this way and I learned this lesson and I whatever matured in this way then like that's a win to me that's wonderful and as far as anxiety goes, what were some of your experiences or are some of your experiences and how do you cope? So I was like crippled with anxiety in starting in like grade grade 10. Um, I'm pretty sure it was grade 10. So it was very random things. Actually, it was, it started in when I was eight and we me and my family didn't know this until again, like we reflected, but my mom told me this is so it's kind of funny. So the way that like my, my family home was set up was like, it was like a split entry when you walk in. So like, the, the top floor was like where all the bedrooms were. And then my dad like does construction. So he actually built a level up on my house and my parents moved their bedroom upstairs. Yeah. So when you come in and I was kind of the main level, they were on a level higher than me. And when I was eight, I had said to my mom, like, I am afraid to go to sleep at night. And she was like, why? What is wrong with you? I said, well, if someone breaks in, they're going to get to me first. And she, like, later on, she was like, I don't know what to say because you were right. <laughs> she was yeah, like, literally, it's valid. Was, it's actually fucking valid. So she was like, I slept on the couch for two years until you, until you kind of got a little bit older because they would get to you first. But that's, like, I think the first kind of notions of me overthinking like not feeling safe things like that um in high school I had this bad anxiety of not wanting to eat in front of other people I I still don't really know where that came from um and it's I still notice like the first time I eat in front of someone like okay this feels weird but it's just eating it's it's fine so many girls though in my grade and like growing up like we all experience some level of oh I don't want to eat in front of you or in front of anybody yeah, like I don't know what I don't know what it was, but I so I remember I would be in school like and just like be starving to death because I just didn't want to eat in front of other people. So there was that. Um I remember I wouldn't wear like a coat 
to school. I'm like, I live in Canada. It gets freaking cold. Yeah. I, I wouldn't wear a coat to school because there was something anxiety provoking about taking a coat off and hanging it in a locker. Hmm. I don't know. Like, I still don't really understand some of these things of just like, where did that come from? Um, I had a lot of anxiety over like sicknesses. Um, so I didn't eat meat for like four years because I was afraid that like I was going to eat meat and it was going to give me food poisoning. Um, I had genuinely convinced myself that I had a brain tumor at one point. I literally told my mom, I was like, I need to go to the doctor. Like I, there is something really wrong with me. I was getting really headaches. I just, I just needed glasses. Like, oh, I just needed glasses. It was, but I just took it and ran with it. And I remember like my telling my mom that like, no, like I, I really, I was genuinely freaked out because I had a brain tumor and she was like, okay, we need to like do something about this. So at that time was when we decided to go to my family doctor. And then we like, I got on um, antidepressants and they were helpful. Um, the thing with anxiety, and if you're someone that like really suffers from anxiety is I personally found that your brain just moves at such a quick pace that it's so hard to grasp, like what is rational, what is not like, you can't even reason with yourself because you're so just like, I, I describe it as like, my brain is like a pinball machine. There's just thought yeah. in and out. And you can't even grasp like what's real and what isn't. So getting on medication was, it gave me the ability for things to like settle enough for me to at least like make sense of the thoughts that I was thinking. And from there, I was able to learn techniques of like breathing through anxiety attacks, breathing through panic attacks, um, things like that. It did like prevent me a little bit from things like social events. Sometimes if I just like wasn't if I was having an anxious day, um, I remember after having a panic attack, I would feel so physically drained. Like I would be stomach sick, have headaches. Like I couldn't go to school the next day because they're so like hard on your body, obviously. Um, so going through that and like kind of getting on medication was helpful. Also going to the gym. And I still now like I can notice myself get like more antsy and a little bit, I'm, I'm more touchy uh -huh. if I'm like out of my gym routine. I just think it's something that's so good for like regulating my routine for, and even it's not about for me, the, like I have like a condo gym downstairs uh -huh. and I still drive 30 minutes to my gym every single day instead of training downstairs because I need that like mental release of like being in the gym atmosphere and like uh -huh. just having that that mental moment I think for myself I think it's also things like it's time to like practice deep breathing like it's just somewhere where you can go and like decompress so that is still something that again I love I love lifting like I said but it also like really helps to keep to keep me feeling grounded there's proven benefits too to the act of squeezing and releasing squeezing yeah. and releasing so it's almost like a progressive muscle relaxation but intentional in the gym like mm -hmm. you're literally putting your body through an act of stress and relief of that stress and so yeah. i think it also helps to just regulate your overall like feelings physically yeah, um, something to put it into and i like how you talked about the medication um mm -hmm. i think some of the misunderstandings about medication is like you'll just stop thinking, you'll numb mm -hmm. out. What it usually does is it allows people to start to think more rationally. Yes. Like it takes you from being here or here and it puts you like, oh, now I can see maybe a solution or a, a, a belief to refute or dispute this belief. And when you have anxiety, even other mood disorders, mm -hmm. you'll often like find yourself in the what if zip code. Yes. And it's hard to move out. It's hard to move out of the what if zip code because it really is. you'll convince yourself that this is where, this is what keeps you safe. It's safest here. This is the best place you can be because if you what if it to death, then you'll prevent anything from happening. So it's not just what if I'm the first, what if someone breaks in and then they get me first? It's, <laughs> well, what if they, what if someone breaks in? What if they get me first? What if my whole family hears me die? What if I, but yes. it, and it, it doesn't stop. Whereas yeah. most people who aren't 
struggling with that. Might just say, yeah, if someone broke in, they'd probably get me first. Okay, I'll just lock my door. I'll lock my door. Also, I grew up in a small town in Newfoundland, Canada. Do you know how common it is for houses to get broken into and children to get stolen? Not to say it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen everywhere, but like... We all, I grew up in a place where my dad would leave the keys in the ignition in the car in our driveway and we w- we could go to bed with the doors unlocked and yeah, nothing would happen. Like I grew up in a very, very safe neighborhood, very safe community. Like it was, it's just your, your thoughts get away from you. And yeah, I think that that's the biggest thing I noticed with being on medication was it just like, it allows you to grasp those mm-hmm. thoughts instead of like letting that snowball happen and that's that's essentially what anxiety is and it's just like it's the snowball so yeah. you can you can grasp it you can stop the snowball and be like let's challenge that thought is this really realistic and I actually when I was in um I went through like counseling for a couple of years and that's one of the worksheets that like I still do in my head today of Let's challenge that thought. Is there evidence to this thought? Is there reason to believe this is going to happen? Like, yeah. is there the putting is, the thoughts on trial? Yeah, like maybe that one just kind of came out of left field there. Let's let's rationalize a little bit, and like I can do that now. Um, but like it's just it's so hard, and especially when you don't really understand. Like, oh, this is just my anxiety. Like, it's hard to grasp it and be like, what do I even challenge first? Like, it's. It's hard. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, there is. And I'm sure you're familiar with the ABCDE method, but I really like that for like you identify the activating event yeah. that caused the belief. And then yeah. you can see the consequences of those beliefs. Yeah. Well, then you go through a series of disputing. Okay. Yeah. This is how I'm going to dispute that belief. And then you have effective new beliefs as a result. And then you're able to reinforce those effective new beliefs. But you have to, you you do have to swim upstream and say, well, what activated that? Because generally these things end up being a cycle. It's a pattern. It's like, oh, I notice every single time, um, let's say every single time someone you're with puts their phone face down, you you start thinking, well, what do they not want me to see? Why do they do that? Da, 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 da. But, and the belief is maybe they are hiding something. And so the consequence of that belief is you lose trust in them. And then you dispute that with, well, I have no reason to not trust them. Maybe they always have put their phone face down and I put my phone face down too. Okay. We're we're good now. Yeah. And something else that I have really like grown into over the past few years is letting go of what you can't control. And that has brought me so much peace. So I read... Um, have you ever read The Four Agreements? No, but I, I'm familiar with it. It's really good. There's there's some agreements that actually change my life. One of them is don't take anything personal. Um, and that's the one that struggles with the most is that it's just, it's basically explaining that everyone is in their own specific universe. Like, and something that we would learn in like the like counseling school as well. Everyone on the planet, you can have two twins grow up in the exact same house have the exact experiences their perception of the world is still different like no one understands you and your point of view no matter how much you explain it because they aren't you so when people are acting and they're doing things nothing is personal nothing is a personal attack on you it doesn't have anything to do with you it's all just people experiencing life in their own ways and acting in a way that they see best fit if it hurts you as, as a result, like that's still you, like that's your interpretation of their actions then is that hurt me. They didn't hurt you, which it seems, it it sounds kind of confusing, right? But it's just, it's like to, to remind yourself that like, there's certain things that are not in your control and getting back to like the example of like the phone being upside down well, okay, what if this person has things on your phone that they don't want you to see? Can you control that? No. So you're going to eventually find out and then you'll deal with it then. If you have to cut them out of your life because they're hiding something shitty from you, then you do it. Like it's what is worrying about it and losing sleep about it and and overthinking it going to change? Nothing. And honestly, for relationships, that has given me a lot of peace because like if someone is going to treat you poorly, they're going to. 
they're just going to. You're stressing about it is not going to change anything. Someone's going to cheat on you. They're just going to cheat on you. So I like to approach situations with trust as much as I can when you have actual logical reason to believe, okay, this person is not treating me. This is, it's not your thoughts. It's you have proof that this person is not treating me the way that I want to be treated. Goodbye. But I do think that, that it took me years and years to like, just realize how easy it is to like, if someone is not serving you, see you later. But that is like, it was really hard for me to accept because it doesn't feel easy, especially like childhood people, relationships where you're like, you love this person. Like it's hard to mm -hmm. just kind of like let go of that control because if, even if things don't go the way that you want, there's nothing you do about it. And the same thing with even going pro. If I was going to go pro this year, great. If not, it's just not my year. Am I going to cry every night about like, what if I don't go pro? It's not going to fix anything. So why would I do that? So true. Like, I love that. Oh, man. Like, I could literally hear you talk forever. <laughs> just let go of what you can't control. It will bring you so much peace. But then it's also like recognizing, okay, well, what can't you control? And that's something that, I mean, when I do like my journaling, sometimes I'll kind of reflect on okay, well, what are the things that are in my control? If I say you have a situation that you're upset over, you and your, you're and your boyfriend are in a fight, or you and your girlfriend are in a fight or whatever is going on and you write down why you're upset. Okay, look at why you're upset and then look at like what is within your control because their, their perception, their mindset, how they're going to act, none of those things are in your control. What you can do is look at how can you react to the situation? What situations can you put yourself in? Do you need to remove yourself? Can you communicate more effectively? Like you can't change other people. You can just change yourself. You can change the situations that you're in. You can change how you communicate. But after that, like you just have a choice of, is this serving me? Great. Do I need to put more effort into this? Great. And if not, if it's not making you happy, then you have the choice of changing it. Which sounds simple, but it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not, really not. Not when you like to have control or you convince yourself that you do. Yeah. Um, something that I learned in a Bible study was like, what's within your control um, can also be like, okay, this is your concern versus your responsibility. So you can be concerned about something, but exactly. it doesn't mean you're responsible for it. Obviously, like, okay, if you have been given the keys to a secret box, <laughs> you are responsible for the secret box. Yes. <laughs> but if there's a secret box and you can't find the key and no one's given it to you, but you know something important in it, you can be concerned about it, but it's not your responsibility. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And you're not going to spend all day trying to open it when you don't need to. And something else that I don't know why this example has always stuck out to me. It really helps me when I'm what ifing down the negative rabbit hole. So imagine a little kid is like at school and he's sitting there and he sees his best friends across the table from him, like whispering. And he goes, Oh, like they're whispering about me. So I don't want to invite them to my birthday party anymore. So Kid goes home, tells his mom, I'm not inviting them to my birthday party anymore. And the mom's like, okay. And the mom's a little bit worried because the mom knows they're planning a surprise party for him. And those two kids are responsible for the surprise party. So they were whispering about the surprise party and maybe noticed he was eating PB&J and they should serve PBJ. But yeah. he internalized it and made it personal and almost lost his friendships over it. That's another one of the agreements is don't make assumptions. And my mm. mom said to me growing up, she said, you know what assuming does? I said, well, what does it do? She just makes an ass of you and me. Literally. You know? but, and it's like, that's honestly, that's a thing too, is that, yeah, I, I do. Like, I remember like growing up when two friends would be hanging out and like, oh my God, they didn't invite me. Like, they must not like me. What if they just ended up together? Like, what if there's just, there's so many things that could have happened and th yeah that's another thing is just like don't assume anything if you are concerned if you're worried about something use your words mm -hmm. communicate if you have a question ask 
Like, don't assume that someone doesn't like you or someone's plotting against you just because, like, maybe the vibes are off. And, like, I, you know, listen to your intuition, but don't jump to that conclusion without speaking and communicating and voicing people. Another, I'm just spitting lessons today. People can't read your mind. Like, and that's another relationship thing is you have to speak. If you want things to change, you have to communicate because people don't, just because you're assuming something, like, it's not on them to be like, oh, you seem off. Are you okay? If you want to talk about something, if there's something going through your head, speak it. Put it into the universe. Deal with it. Because what does just being in your head, what is that going to change? Nothing. No. (laughs) Nothing at all. Literally, it just, and oftentimes... The other person has no idea that anything is even going on in your head. Exactly. And it's unfair to assume that they would. I mean, there's been times where, like, you could read it on someone that they're visibly upset, so you say something. But the person who gives the silent treatment is just as responsible and harmful to a friendship or relationship as the person who is constantly go, 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 go. go. It's It's no different. It's an exercise of... I guess, control or desire to control and figure things out. Exactly. And that's the thing. Yeah. If someone is constantly upsetting you and you know that you're upset by them, like what if they just are oblivious and they just don't know? Like there are like some, I say this sometimes, like it must be so peaceful to be like Delulu of the world sometimes, or just like people, some people are not like in touch and that's fine. That's fine. Like, but either way, even people that are in touch, like no one knows what you're thinking unless you just talk about it. And like that is, I think I've learned, especially since like starting school, how to be a good communicator. And like, I think sometimes people just get so worked up in their emotions. So like journal about it, jot it down, take time to reflect, think about what you're, what you're feeling. But at the end of the day, like if it's, if it's a relationship thing and it's not an internal thing, nothing changes unless you do and that's Mm -hmm. that goes literally everything like if you want to see something change it's it is on you to take that initiative and change it because no one else is going to assume that this is what you need unless you tell them that's right girl we could talk (laughs) i'm almost like i'm eating this up too because like even though i'm a counselor and i am an athlete and i get it like these are great reminders and Mm -hmm. great just refreshers and even reinforcers for things that I'm working on right now. And recent mental health um, realizations I've had in my own life. I'm not ready to talk about them yet, but um, (laughs) I've had some, yeah, I've had some realizations and I'm, I'm trying to practice a lot more. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Feel it out of your mouth. Um, So this is like, amazing uh, just to hear reinforced and I'm not gonna lie this is a total change of subject by the way um your skin this entire podcast I'm like what does she do for her skin like her and if you guys are not watching this on YouTube all the episodes are usually on YouTube celestial underscore fit just a little plug or is it celestial fit it may just be celestial fit um but anyway your skin looks amazing and I'm like does she just drink water is she gonna tell me she just drinks water does she do other stuff um Korean skincare Mm. I will put you on Korean. Really? Yes. Like I, slugging and like okay, it's just I I don't use that much. But two two products that I do feel are worth it is vitamin C. It's I do recommend getting like a invest in it. Um, I've gotten vitamin C from Ross, and I've noticed a difference. But I know it's not the same as actual. I I do invest in like the Vivier or the SkinCeuticals. Okay. Um, it costs me like $200 a bottle, which is not ideal for skincare, but it does last like almost a year. Oh, so okay. it's like, a, it's like a, it hurts to, to, to pay for, but then it lasts a long time. Um, and then a retinol, like if you can get like a prescribed retinol, that is. Or go to Mexico. Down in, yeah, yeah. Exactly. $25 for a bottle of retinol. That's yeah. Like what the hell. So if, if you're near Mexico absolutely go do that um but other than that like so again I have I have a friend um, I have to credit her she's probably gonna listen to this um as well shout out so she is just like she's so freaking smart she 
does a lot of research on like skin stuff so she basically looked at like all of like skin suiticals and vva like ingredients and then she looked at the like the korean skincare formulas and she found that some of them are the exact same if not huh. better in the korean skincare and for like a quarter of the price of Korean skincare or the Korean skincare is a quarter of the price? Korean skincare is a quarter of the price of like your pharmaceutical brands. Huh. Yeah. Tea. You could be an ambassador, dude. Her. <laughs> Everyone that is like, oh my God, what skincare do you use? I'm like, it's not that much. I have um, two toners and a moisturizer. Did you have a purge when you started using retinol? Honestly, no. Um, I do feel like I have pretty like tough skin. Like, I've never really been prone to, like, like I've always had pretty clear skin. It's just a lot more, like, glowy now. Um, So my skin with retinol was honestly fine. I feel like I'm an outlier, though. But it was like- Mine's like, oh, we're using <laughs> retinol this week. Let's also have a major breakout for the next two weeks. I'm like, I'm taking it so slow. Like, I've been so slow with retinol because I'm like, there's no rush. I'm just like taking it easy. And now that it's winter, I'm going to pick up how often I use it because I'm less yeah. worried or fall. I'm less worried about sun exposure. Yeah, I I do use it like pretty well every day. When I first started, it was like, wow. Little, yeah, I know. I use it every day. Um, But I, I moisturize a lot too. The yeah. only thing I really get breakouts is around my cycle, which I just came off birth control in January for the first time in 10 years. How are you doing? Did you get your blood work done? I have not gotten blood work done since because I did my, I like literally came off in January and started my prep in February. Wow. So I'm like, okay, well, it's going to be fucked up <laughs> because I just did my prep. So I have a referral. I'm going to get my blood work done. And oh, think that's I good. Um, I did. However, like I got my IUD out in January. Yeah. I got a period in February. And then I got another regular one in March, another regular one in April, and another one in May. I skipped like one period that was supposed to be like literally right around my show day. And then I think I missed July as well. And I got one in August. Wow. Again, I feel like I'm an outlier because I don't feel like like when I got my IUD taken out, my gynecologist was like, expect it to be like six months to a year before you get a regular period. Yeah, and my body was like, "Just kidding, here you go." <laughs> One, two, We've been holding this back for far yeah. too long. The floodgates are open, y'all. Yeah, here we go. And the same thing, like when I got my first period after I competed, I usually have a pretty like light period. I was in the gym running around like a lunatic because I had bled through the one tampon that I brought, and I was like, oh. "What do we do?" Like I'm literally in the middle of my workout, like ask everyone in the gym for a tampon. I found one, but yeah, it was floodgates opened so yeah I don't really know like I I don't feel like I had any crazy like skin things my my like I, I seem pretty normal the only things that I've noticed is I get a little bit more like PMS before my period yeah. now like I do want to kill everyone the week yeah. before my period's gonna start um a little bit of breakouts like I get like I, I think it's my cheeks on my period and then my chin when I'm ovulating it's or huh. maybe reverse but it's something to do with with like my it's definitely hormonal um and that's wow. pretty much it that's so awesome definitely, yeah that's definitely a rare story but a good one because I think it's easy to to like get convinced everything you see online is going to be your reality and you get worked up about it and sometimes mm -hmm. that's not the case um which is a wonderful thing like let your experience be your own, right? Going back to the whole letting of control, you don't know how your body's going to respond, but you know you want to come off of it and you'll just adapt and adjust if you need to. Yeah. And you've obviously had success. And gosh, there's such a good feeling when you give a girl in the gym a tampon who needs one. Oh, I know. I was like, thank you so much. And like this girl that I got it from was like, she's like very deep in prep right now. So she's like, you're lucky that this is still here. This is still in my bag. I'm actually not having a period right now either. So here you go. This is awesome. one of the lingering ones. The emergency tampon that's yeah. not been used in five yeah. months. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love yeah. that. So 
I feel like we've talked about more than I could have ever imagined, which is awesome. I mean, I love when that happens because when I was prepping your episode and reading through your Instagram, I was like, I just feel like this is probably going to flow. Mm-hmm. And it did. And girls. <laughs> yeah, correct. That's exactly it. I hope that people are listening though. And they're like, they feel like they were in the room with us or, you know, like yapping with us. And if you are listening and feel that way, like definitely tag us Mm -hmm. um, that you listened and let us know what you thought. But before we wrap this up, I got to ask you for your best advice. So what is your best advice for someone who has never competed before, but wants to, and then your best advice for someone who's on their road to pro? Um, I mean, I think just like, an accumulation of everything that we talked about today. Yeah. I think that we, we, we've been spinning lessons this whole time, really. If you haven't learned anything yet, yeah. um, we're paying attention. You better be reborn coming out of this episode. <laughs> this is like more wisdom than I've ever spent in my life. Um, I think the control one is is huge, um, especially in your first prep. Like it's gonna feel hard. There's gonna be days that you're gonna wonder, like, why the hell I'm you're doing this um I mean like ground yourself come back to your why come back to like what made you start this in the first place and then really remember like in order to kind of manage your stress like look at what you can control do that which is in prep it's it's following your meal plan it's getting your cardio done it's trying to see the good and and focusing on all the things you've accomplished throughout your prep and then letting go of things that you can't like what is my placing going to be? And what if someone shows up that looks amazing? And like, like those are things that you just do not have control over. So they're not worth your stress. And that goes the same for like the road to pro too. Like thing with, and I think honestly, like for me competing in national shows was a little bit easier because you were able to go in with it with the expectation of everyone doing this show looks amazing. Every single person doing this show has worked their ass off to be there everyone has stage experience everyone here is is going for the same thing and I read this quote a long time ago and it honestly changed everything it was um I think it was lilies lilies and daisies or roses and daisies are both beautiful but the two of them look nothing alike and I applied that to like so many things and I mean, with regards to like as women, I, I feel like a lot of us compare ourselves and then relationships yeah. again, like, is this girl prettier than me? And is my ex's new girlfriend prettier than me? And anyways, you know, you get what I'm saying. In competing, it's the same of like one person or everyone there is going to look amazing. That doesn't take away from your amazing. Like mm-hmm. you can show up and you can look like a pro and there can be 15 girls there that look like a pro. But if it, it just it's your day or it's not. And bodybuilding is subjective. Like it's a lot of things. It's the look, but it's also like, what are the judges in the mood for? And who are you standing next to? Like it's a subjective sport. And I think the sooner that you learn that, the sooner that you can kind of let go of the actual comparison and just like you bring your best, you show up. If it's your day, it's your day. And if it's not, you keep showing up if that's what you want to do. Um, And yeah, that was, that was helpful for me of just kind of like, all you can do is just be there and bring your best and be proud knowing that you like really gave it your all, um, during, during your prep and all the time leading up to, to the show that you're doing, like every single experience, it's not just your prep is the thing is that it's like all of your life experience leading up to getting on stage contribute to you actually walking on that stage. So don't let it just be like, oh, I I sucked my upon like that's that's great but look at like what what actually made you want to compete like what shitty things have you been through and shitty days shitty relationships shitty people shitty mindsets shitty whatever because all of those things led you to being on stage so let it be a testament to not only your ability to like stick to a plan but like show up for I mean the person that like really probably didn't think that the the version of you that didn't think that you would ever actually be there because I think all of us have had a moment where it's like oh my god I'm actually doing this so that's really the the important part I think of competing is you're there for you being your best you that's is that even advice I don't even great advice oh my gosh that's great advice I want to print out that quote I love (laughs) that quote that that's amazing 
Mm. I, I truly just love everything that you've shared today. I think you're a blessing to the industry as a coach and seem to be a counselor too. And wherever you take that, I know it's going to be awesome. Um, I'm thrilled that we got to talk today and I want people to be able to connect with you, work with you, follow your journey. So how can they do that? So mainly I use Instagram. I really should, like, I'm trying to be a TikTok girl. Like I, I, I think yeah. I, I can yap enough for YouTube. Like I know that I can, but for now, Instagram and it's ajmiles.fit. I debated doing the IFB pro, but for now it's still, it's still fit. IFB pro is in the name, but not, not the handle. I got you. Yeah. I think about that too. Sometimes I'm like, do I want to change my handle? Like I don't even do fitness coaching. I'm literally a celestial fit. And I'm like, no, because it's always been that. Now it's water stamped on everything. My well, website's such a commitment to change your handle. Like people will search for you and be like, where did she go? I know. I don't know. I maybe later on, but for now, she's still fit. Yeah, she's a fit girly. <laughs> she's a fit girl. Just happens to be a pro as well. <laughs> yeah, just so happens. So we'll put that in the show notes page. You guys, as always, on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening right away, it'll be at the top of that page. If you're listening in the future, just scroll down to the category section. It's alphabetized. So you'll find not just how to connect with us, but also a episode summary, a bulleted list of all the topics we covered, and timestamps so you can go back and listen to your favorite parts. Or, of course, share it with your friends, your teammates, your family. Let them know what resonated with you. And... Thank you all so much for tuning in, for listening, for sharing. It goes such a long way for myself and the athletes. If you feel inspired to leave a rating and review, thanks in advance for that as well. And with all that being said, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever you are in the world while you're listening to this episode. Let's make it awesome.